Our Old Testament reading for today is taken from the book of the first book of Samuel, the third chapter, beginning at the first verse. Then the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. And it came to pass at that time while Eli was lying down in his place, and when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see, and before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was lying down, that the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here I am. So he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. And he said, I did not call you, lie down again. And he went and lay down. Then the Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. He answered, I did not call you, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again a third time. Then he rose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you did call me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you must speak. Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood and called at, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, Speak, for your servant hears. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle lesson for today is taken from the first letter to the Corinthians, the second chapter, beginning at the sixth verse. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained for the ages for our glory which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as, as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into your heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things are of God. The deep things of God. For what man knows the things of man except the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. Alleluia. Beginning at the 33rd or verse. Glory be to you, o Lord. And Jesus said, Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, Do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot take one, make one hair white or black. Nor, but let, but let your yes be yes, and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. This is the word of the Lord. This is the gospel of the Lord. together the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and of all things visible and invisible. And I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten but not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made. And who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man 
and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated now as we sing our next hymn, hymn number 528. This is one phrase I suppose that each of us should be taking to heart every time we read scripture. 
Too often we read scripture putting our own thoughts and reasons into it, or trying to make it make sense to our reason, and to make it somehow fit our convenience, rather than simply opening our ears and hearing what God has to say, and then submitting to it. We would rather manipulate God's word to be comfortable to our ears, rather than truly hearing it, and then obeying it. I think this is one reason, of course, why many people, even Christians, avoid reading their Bibles, because they understand, actually, those who believe understand, well, if I read it and it says it, then maybe I have to do it, so better not to read it, but I don't know. But we still can't get around it. So this is why it's so important for us as Christians that we read our Bible every day, so that God speaks to us and we might truly listen. When we read scripture and listen properly, yes, we hear that we're sinners. But we also hear the good news. We hear of God's love. We hear of things that are beyond our understanding. Like we read from the passage of 1 Corinthians today, the Holy Spirit, speaking through Paul and the apostles, reveals to us now in the Word what cannot be known in any other way. The mystery of God, the mystery that is beyond us, and that mystery is that God, who is just, God, who is holy, still loves us with an unbounded love, so much so that he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, into the world to take on our sins, to take on our punishment, to experience God's wrath that we deserve on himself, so that we, simply by faith and by his grace, be saved from God just wrath. And that leads us to our short passage from the gospel. Because we read in these words very simple, let your yes be yes, you know we know. And that is the basis of the sermon today. As I said at the beginning of the service, this is part of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus often says, yes, you've heard it said this, you've heard, heard they said this, you've read this in Scripture, but I tell you, and when Jesus says, I tell you, he's saying, thus says the Lord, because he is the Lord. This is the prophets in the Old Testament, and thus says the Lord, not thus says Amos, not thus says Elijah, but thus says the Lord. And Jesus says, I tell you, he is the Lord. He's saying, thus says your Lord. And we are faced with what we need to do, the law, right? Now, the behaviors and words that God demands that we do, these are the law. What Jesus says about being, being merciful, what Jesus says about not hating our neighbor, what Jesus says about saying, uh, what Jesus says about turning the other cheek, he says all these things, these are the law. And these things we are really called to fulfill and must fulfill. And our passage today adds to this. It says we are told that we should never make unnecessary vows. We should never take oaths saying, I swear by this, that, or the other thing. We are told simply that our yes is yes and our no is no, and that these words should stand and should need nothing else to underline our word. The Old Testament is filled with rules concerning vows, and if you make a vow, you have to keep it. Especially if you make a vow to God, you must keep it. And there are all kinds of things that traditions that rose up, what kind of vows you could fudge on, if you didn't swear by the right thing, maybe you'd get away with it, but that's not part of this. It may be part of what Jesus is addressing, but it's really not what I want to talk about today. But there are many things concerning vows in the Old Testament. It's interesting to read. The last time I preached on this sermon, I did mention a lot of those things, rehearsed a lot of them. Um, if you're interested, you can read the laws of Moses, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. You know, look for what it says about oaths and how you must keep them. There are also vows mentioned in Genesis and in the Old Testament prophets. There's even a place where God makes a promise and he swears by himself. <laughs> because who is God going to swear by? I swear, you know, I swear by God to tell the truth. No, I swear by myself. This is what's going to happen. But he, here now, Jesus tells us not to make vows based on anything. We don't swear an oath. I swear, I, you know, uh, whatever. I swear on my mother's grave, or whatever it is, but 
that simply our yes should be yes and our no should be no. Now, considering this on its face value, first of all, this is actually great advice, right? When I say yes, I should fulfill it. If I say no, my no should stand. Especially for parents with little children, this is very important. If I say yes to my child, if I promise them something, I need to fulfill it. If I tell them not to do something or I say no, I need to stick to my no. We learn even from secular psychology that a parent's fulfilling yes and a firm no sets good boundaries for their children and actually teaches them that they can set limits to themselves. If you never say no to your child, they can never say no to themselves, and then in later in life you got a problem, right? So in other words, being able to know to yourself is important, but it, you learn it by people having told you no and sticking to it. We also say no, right, to sin and temptations. We say no to the devil. And this is good. So it's nice and comforting to know, be, this, look how smart and wise Jesus is. He gives us this stuff long before secular psychology figured it out. And of course, following, the, following our word is also good in our personal relationship. If I say, yes, I'm going to do something, it is very important that I do it. And of course, refusing to do something and saying no is also important that it's solid and not wishy-washy. But in our relationships, I think the yes part is a little more demanding, right? If I say I'm going to do something, I should do it. If I say I'm going to pray for someone, I better remember to do it. And I shouldn't say yes if I really think I won't do it or I can't do it. As inconvenient as it might be to say no to someone's face, to say yes and then change my mind is really not good at all, is it? When I may say yes to someone because I don't want to disappoint them, and they begin to count on what I have agreed to do, and then I don't do it, that's even worse, right? When I don't follow through, I have let them down. As inconvenient as it might be to say no to someone's face, it is much more inconvenient to not have followed through have let them down. So we see all this good divine wisdom and teaching, but this is also the law. For Christians, no earth, oath, or swearing by anything outside ourselves is necessary. Our word, our simple yes or no, should be enough. We need to keep our words. As Christians, people should be able to trust our word. And why? Well, because we are representatives of God. By being examples of of being trustworthy in our word, we bear witness to God's word being trustworthy as well. Now if we consider this, we can see this is really what our text is about. As much as our yes being yes and no being no is good worldly wisdom for us to follow in our personal relationships and with our children and with those around us, as much as trustworthiness in our word bears witness to God's trustworthiness, it is God's trustworthiness that we're talking about. This really goes back to Christ Jesus and his word to us. As much as this teaching is teaching us Christians how we are to behave concerning our word, Jesus is actually underlining, revealing about himself and his word. His yes and his no. His no to Satan and death and his yes to us in our salvation. Jesus is our God. Come in the flesh. He is our God who come dwelling among us, and he tells us this about yes being yes, and no being no, not to shame us, not to simply advise us or teach us how to use our yes and no, but more so to reveal how he uses his yes and his no. He teaches us, finally, that his yes and no shall stand. There is no need for a vow, no need for anything else than to understand this word, this yes, and this no. This does mean, of course, that first the law does stand. It does mean, yes, that God's no stands. The no of the law stands. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and therefore all have earned God's wrath and just punishment and eternal damnation. damnation. This is the no. No to sin. No to breaking the law. Breaking then of the law justifies God's wrath. 
justifies our punishment. This is something we may, in the world around us, may forget. But there is the no of hell. There is the no of punishment. God does say no to sin. He does say, this is not my will. This is contrary to why I created you. This is not what it's about, a big no. But as true and solid as God's no of the law is, we also have God's yes. His yes is just as solid and true and unchangeable as his no. As much as the law shall stand, as sure as there is hell, there is also grace and there is also heaven. As sure as there is God's no to sin, there is his yes to forgiving sinners who repent. The same Lord, the same God, whose law exposes our sin and demands that we reject it, also speaks to us the gospel that through faith in Jesus Christ, He is ready, willing, and able, desires to forgive, and has done everything necessary to forgive us, redeem us, and save us. His very yes, His very yes is of His life. The yes of His coming to seek and save the lost, the yes that he spoke over each of us at our baptisms, that we are his and his alone, that he died for us. His yes that says, yes, you are mine, I have saved you, and so the doors of my heavenly kingdom are open to you. We receive this yes because of what he has done. It is his yes to us, not our yes of agreement. It is his yes to us that he keeps his promise. For us, then, it is a small thing that we imitate him by keeping our word and our word to others. For God's note to sin, death, and the power of the devil over us stands. And his yes of our salvation is a yes that empowers us now to live already in his grace, fighting and repenting of the sin that we deal with daily, trusting in his grace, so we might live fully in that grace now and in his eternal kingdom. So now may the peace of the Lord pass and understand and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus now and unto life everlasting.